what is your outlook on the future of Bitcoin? Do you think it's inevitable? Yeah, so I do think it's past the point of inevitability. I don't think, barring like a black swan event that in some way cripples the infrastructure, I don't think it's very likely to have a failure point at this point. I see the next 10 to 20 years, especially globally playing out with a series of currency wars. And I think we're starting to see that a little bit already. You know, you've seen countries like Venezuela, Lebanon, Zimbabwe, etc. have their currencies really collapse. And in most of those cases, the black market US dollar has sort of taken over. The fact is that's kind of how money works. Money emerges and people will end up choosing what they think is the best money for them as a whole. And, and just like when you have a path through a field where everyone instinctively knows where the path is supposed to be and they all walk in that same spot and then the path emerges, that's how money emerges. In most of those cases, it is emerged to be the US dollar. And I think we're gonna see a drastic increase in the number of failed currencies that happen around the world because this tool that every government in the world has been using to essentially print money to spend money is nearing the end of its usefulness. And a lot of these countries, either they've already fallen off the cliff, like the ones I mentioned, or there's other ones like Argentina. And I would say Canada, very much in that like Wile E. Coyote moment, hovering over the cliff and about to fall. And I think 10, 15 years from now, we'll probably see a world where there are like six or seven currencies left in the world. And most of the countries of the world have switched to the US dollar or regional currencies, one kind or another. I think Bitcoin will be one of those. Bitcoin will be competing with these currencies. And inevitably, that process of emergent order will bring the best money to the top. All right, Dave Bradley, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I saw you are, I would say, a true OG. You mined your first Bitcoin in 2010. Yeah, could you tell me a bit about how you got into Bitcoin at that time and how your perspective has also changed over time now, 14 years later? Yeah, yeah. So I got in, like I said, 2010. I was on a on a forum somewhere researching GPU graphics cards that I was looking to buy for gaming and found some mentions of Bitcoin. And this is like right when GPU mining became a thing. There was a brief period where, like at the start, everyone was mining it with their CPUs. And there was a brief period where GPUs were the best thing going. And then it moved on to FPGAs and then ASICs. But I got there right when the GPUs came in. And so somebody on the forum was like, hey, if you buy this this card instead of this other card, you can mine Bitcoin with it. And I looked into it a little bit, kind of wrote it off. And then eventually when I went to buy the card, I was like, you know what, let's just try and let's just try and see if I can make a little bit of money with this. And so for me at the start and for most people at the start, and and still this is how a lot of people get into the space to this day, is I got in there looking for a way to make some money. And when I thought about money, I was thinking about dollars. So I wanted to mm. use mining Bitcoin as a way to make more dollars. And yeah. I got very lucky because very early on, right around the time that I got in, and started mining, the price had gone from $1 up to $14 overnight. And so my GPU paid for itself really fast. And I basically just like turned my whole basement into a GPU monstrosity mining Bitcoin. And I right. think that that journey has really changed till now in the sense that the way that I look at Bitcoin is totally different, right? Like I, I was looking at it as a, a way to make some money. And a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the discussion that was out there around Bitcoin on, it was, it was on Reddit, it was on Bitcoin forum talk mostly at this point, was largely discussing the fact that Bitcoin was a better payment tool. And there was a lot of reliance on the fact that it was an irreversible payment. And there was a lot of talk that it was anonymous back then too, which we know is now not entirely true. But that's kind of what a lot of people were talking about. And there was very few discussions in the community back then about the hard money aspect of Bitcoin. And, you know, nowadays a new Bitcoiner comes in, you've got the Bitcoin standard that everybody starts with. And, you, you know, you've got these hundreds of hours of unlimited numbers of influencers talking about hard money. And so it's yeah. actually a lot easier to, to figure it out now, I think, than it was back then. But it took years for me to figure out that that's the real point. Yeah. So this wasn't something that you were into before. This was just really... You know, I see a money making opportunity. That's basically it. Yeah. So you are you are the example of you know come for the uh, network and stay for the revolution, basically. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was I was like a lot of the people who got back in there. I was just like a like a like a nerd mm -hmm. who was interested in the technology, and you know I wasn't really thinking of it as a tool for freedom back then. 
and, and, and frankly, the world, like the world wasn't in as rough of a state back then in 2010, we didn't need the freedom as badly as we do now. And the problems that are now manifesting from the ever increasing scope of the imperialist control of the globalist governments around the world and, and their unlimited appetite for power and the money that they print to achieve that, the, the, those problems are really manifesting in a really hard way nowadays. And if you go and ask the average person on the street in Canada or in the Netherlands about inflation, I'm going to guess that the average person has some stuff to say about it now, right? They, yeah. They've been hurt by inflation. They've felt it in their pocketbook. Whereas even five years ago, people had heard of inflation, but it was like this nebulous thing that like the government reports on that they didn't really care about, right? And yeah. now people are starting to become aware that there's this issue where the value they thought they had is going away. And so I think we're now in a position where a lot more people are ready to hear the message of Bitcoin. And there's luckily a lot more content out there for people to consume that will will get them to the point of understanding what the, the real important elements of Bitcoin are, which are, are relatively simple. At the end of the day, it's a long, deep, complex topic, but the, the core stuff is pretty simple. And I think we're right on that crux where a huge number of new people are going to start looking to Bitcoin as a solution to this this yeah. many-headed monster of government control. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with, you know, perfectly, as you said, there's enough factual information that can teach you, like, how this works. But I think that the, the topic of conversation around the problem or what the implications of adopting Bitcoin would be, you know, are, are way more important and also pretty hard to... I think grasp in a sense, right? Like even when you experience the problem, I, I, I talk about that a lot, right? You see a lot of TikToks, Instagram reels, whatever, like uh, posts any, in any type of people who are like, yeah, I can't afford my grocery bills or why is a watermelon $30 or and stuff like that. But they still, so they have like a problem, but they don't know where the problem comes from, right? As you said, uh, and I agree five years ago, if someone told me inflation still even if when I was into Bitcoin, I would think like, yeah, that's it's just a thing. Like I totally did not understand what what that was or how it worked or how it came about, right? So I, I, I do think people feel the problem, but yeah, we should talk about explaining the problem, I think, more. Yeah, I, I think we're right on this interesting spot too, because people are feeling that problem and they're being told that the problem is a whole bunch of different things, right? And so... yeah. There is this globalist, like the uniparty machine that really is set up to divide and is set up to create scapegoats for the reasons that people's lives are getting worse and more difficult. And so you have, and to use the, like the American example that's obviously very visible is you got the Trump and the Biden sides mm -hmm. and the, the Biden side will tell you that it is the patriarchy and white supremacists and billionaires and grocery stores the greedy mm -hmm. grocery stores yeah that's who they'll tell you is causing these problems yeah and the trump side will tell you that it is illegal immigrants and over taxes and really the the problem that's going on is the money printing on both sides the both sides are are equally as greedy to print more money and i think we're at a point at least as, at least in canada here where you know, we had a little bit more of a wake up call with our entire with our, our trucker convoy mm -hmm. than a lot of places in the world that really resonated with a lot of people. And I think that there are way more people now that are starting to wake up, not just to the fact that there is a problem. That's the first step that you mentioned, where it's like this sucks. People are feeling it. The second step is realizing that the problem itself is actually the overreach of government in, yeah. in every way possible. And the value that a person should be earning when they provide value with their time to someone else, a huge percentage of that is being siphoned away and spent on things that are actually not in that person's best interest. They're actually actively co counter to that person's best interests in many mm. cases where we're seeing, you know, all the, the, the insane liberal policies of, of, you know, the, the, the approach to drugs that has turned our, our North American cities into, I don't know if you've been to a North American major city recently, but they're, they're zombie lands. You know, there's crackheads everywhere. They're, uh, it's, it's out of control. And it's because this segment of the population 
the name, namely, namely the liberal left in this particular example, has given themselves the authority to take the value that we create and spend it in ways that they deem fit. And because there's no incentive for them to spend that value in a way that actually makes sense for the, the population of this city, they spend it in a way that makes sense for them. And there's no repercussions to that thus far. There's no there's no blowback for the bad decisions that they make. And so in a city like in Calgary, where I, I am, instead of you know directly addressing the problem of vagrancy and drug abuse the way that it, they used to do, which is to you know, make people stop being a public nuisance, at least. Our money is being spent on bike lanes and rainbow painted sidewalks and nonsense that has no actual impact on the on the lives of the people who paid for that stuff. And so I think that's the big disconnect that people are starting to see. And my my cautiously optimistic number is in Alberta, where I'm at, which is a much more freedom oriented part of the country. It's like the, the Texas of, of Canada generally referred to. I, I, I think we're in the area of like 20 to 30 percent of people have at least woken up to the idea that the government is the problem. And then now, as I've been engaging with those communities, sort of the freedom community, I'm seeing that they're very open to the idea that okay, the government is the problem. The overreach of the government is the problem. And now we have a solution that we can present them with, which is like, why don't we take away their ability to steal that money from us in the first place and spend it on all these ridiculous things? And the answer to that is obviously Bitcoin. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, so many thoughts. Yeah, so I've not been in Canada. Actually, I met a guy this week and he just had like a four-week trip in Canada. He went to Saskatchewan. He went totally off-grid. He went to Toronto, he went to Vancouver, and he said that he was shocked. Very interesting. He was thinking about emigrating to, to, to Canada before, and now he's like, it's just, it's just the same as America, right? And I have some, I'm, I'm shareholder in a, in a, in a Canadian company. So we have, and then they're in Toronto and I ask them sometimes, like when I speak to the founder, like, is it really like what I see on the internet, right? Like, is it really like that? And he's like, yeah, like it really changed. Like I grew up in Toronto and it's really different. And even today I saw a video of like a vending machine at a hospital that has like crack pipes or something like yeah. that. I, I don't know. It sounds so ridiculous. Even now it, like, I'm saying the words and I'm like, yeah, really? You know, but yeah, like when I talk to people in Canada, I just ask like, is that real? Like, is, is that, you know, it, it, it feels so dystopic, like unreal. And I, but I also think that's, that's where I wanted to go. Like, what is so hard, even when you hear people talk about this, it feels so, it's so confrontational, right? Like, the, I think you would agree, you know, the entire Bitcoin journey is not an IQ, but a, but an ego journey, right? And one of the things that you have to realize is that I think we were all part of a party in the West last 20 years. Maybe for you, you're a bit older, you know, I think 70s, 80s, 90s were the real party, right? But that party is over. 
for a few years already. And we're like, you know, some people are still dancing, you know, but the music has stopped. And I think like just reconciling with that is a huge, huge, huge thing. Even before you can be comfortable with what comes after reconciling and then looking for the solution, right? But just that is is just really huge, even from a distance, let alone, you know, living in it. Yeah, it's this, it's this, this culture that really, I think, got started in the 80s. I was born in the 80s. And so I didn't really get to benefit from this, but I was, I was around for it, I guess. This, this culture of essentially spending the value of the future. Exactly. That yeah. has pervaded both the governments and the individuals in the West. You know, we have a credit driven culture where people are very, very driven by materialism and status. You know, I know, I know people who have, you know, great jobs. Mary, I, I can think of one, one couple in particular in, in Calgary that have, you know, they both have oil and gas jobs, which is kind of our like bread and butter here. Mm -hmm. So they're both making very good money and they live in a really nice house that they have a very big mortgage on and they have two very expensive cars and a, an expensive RV and they're basically broke, you know, like they've borrowed, they, they make a lot of money, but then they use the fact that they make so much money to borrow to the, the last dollar they can, they can wring out of the system. And yeah, I mean, it gets, it, it, it kicks the can down the road and that's kind of the way our, our culture has been running and we're, we're finally getting to a point, I think, where, you know, the can can no longer be kicked any further down the road. And I like the, the analogy, if you know, like the Bugs Bunny, like the mm -hmm. Roadrunner Wile E. Coyote yeah. cartoon, and you got this moment where the Roadrunner like zips across this canyon and the coyote runs out there. And he's not fast enough to zip across the canyon. So he has this moment where he like freezes midair mm, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he hasn't realized that he's subject to the laws of gravity and is about to start falling yet. And that's like where we're at right now in Western society, I feel is like we're already off the cliff. Like it's already too late to back this up. You know, if we had, and I don't, I, I don't know exactly what your, your government situation in the Netherlands is, but I, I know that a lot of places in the world have this kind of battle right now between the sort of right wing populist and the the globalist leftists that are are you know seemingly losing some ground in a lot of places in the world the right wing populists are coming into power more and more but realistically these right wing populists are just going to keep printing money and spending it and really it's just yeah they can just, also not escape it right? yeah, but, yeah. It's, it's it's just a disagreement about how they spend the money that they steal mm. right yeah. and realistically if it, like we've got we've got the the very popular Justin Trudeau as our prime minister here who will likely soon be replaced and if the guy that is going to replace him were to come into office and say hey I'm going to cut back spending and government positions down to a 2019 level that would be that would be viewed as an insane extreme move extreme austerity when in reality the 2019 levels were beyond unsustainable they were already way too high Mm. to ever be sustainable and so it's it, it it's really at a point where the kind of cuts that would need to happen to the apparatus of government to keep the keep the idea of the large-scale nation state as exists right now viable are in the range of like 95 percent you know they need yeah. they need to cut down almost everything that they do to a point where in, in some places the economy is almost entirely based on those government jobs and mm. these these government jobs who don't really provide any value, they move they move papers around, they issue permits, they get in the way of real businesses, and in turn create this entire parasitic class of other jobs whose only role, you know, I call them the lube industry. This is like this is most lawyers, any lawyers that deal with regulatory practice. There are a million regulatory consultants in the world. The the the, the Deloitte's the big four, the accountants of the world, the tax accountants, all of these jobs only exist because the government exists. Mm. And the reason that I call them the lube industry is because their entire role is to make it not hurt as bad when the government fucks you. And that, 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 that whole industry could go away if the massive burdensome pile of regulatory nonsense went away. We're in a situation now, and, and this is true everywhere that I've seen in the world, and and I get I, I have I have pers personal firsthand experience of this in Canada, United States, Mexico, and the UK fairly recently. That you cannot run a business of any kind without almost immediately running into a government created roadblock. 
Mm-hmm. And whether it's the need for a permit or a, a significant license or, or, or zoning or whatever it is, you're immediately going to have to ask permission to run your business from somebody who does not understand your business and has no incentive to understand your business. Yeah. And well, they need something to do. <laughs> they need something yeah, to it, do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, that apparatus is what will ultimately need to be dismantled one way or the other. And it will be dismantled either through the extreme austerity that would be necessary, or it will be dismantled by defunding the whole mess, which yeah. will inevitably happen with the rise of Bitcoin and their loss of the ability to print money to spend money. Yeah, I, I had to think about a video I saw last week about a woman who had like a nail salon or a hair salon or something, and she had like five, six people working for her. And she asked them, how much taxes? There, apparently there's a salary tax or something. So of course, I don't know everything, but like she has to pay taxes to be able to pay her employees. And uh, she asked the employees, like, how much do you think I spent? And they're like 10, 30, 40. And then she says like, no, 287,000 or something in one year. And it just sounds so discouraging, right? I think that's also why I personally get pulled really towards, yeah, the, the, the I mentioned ego before, but more like the, the, the spiritual part of what is money? What does broken money do? You know, like the entire battle of, of incentives, basically, right? Because yeah, to go back to the party analogy, like who's who's going to stand up and say like, well, we partied like there's no tomorrow. We paid, we paid it with economic energy from tomorrow, right? And now the people after us, um, you know, especially in America, I think you work one day a week to help the government pay for interest on a loan that you you know, this shows for millennials as a millennial probably didn't even benefit from wild. Just that thought is so wild, you know, like, did you ever agree to that? Do you ever think about that? You know, what does that do with your freedom in the freest country in the world? You know, like, yeah, the, these questions are, are, yeah, fascinating to me. And, and yeah, so, so do you, do you also see it kind of like that? Like, do you see yeah. a spiritual part <laughs> here or? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this goes in, it'd be great to, we just actually launched a new, a new YouTube show on a channel that I acquired with a company that I started and the, the channel or so the new show is called unhypnotized oh, and cool. it's, it's coming very much from this kind of same perspective. And the idea is to discuss with, with a lot of overlap to the, the spiritual, because I believe that's what this is. It, it discusses the overlap between money and the mind and mm-hmm. how the two affect each other. And I feel like there's this, this is one episode that we, we did on this show already. I feel like there's what, I, what I've coined as a great malaise. And so it's this general feeling that is pervading a lot of society that you see a lot of people trying to get out from under with things like hypnosis or hypnotherapy. People go to therapy, people find religion, people go to science for these same things. They're, they're, they're seeking meaning in a world that is increasingly hard to connect with. And I think that the connection that people are missing with the world is actually a result of that degradation of our money. And one of the most fundamental things that money is supposed to do is to provide a connection between your actions and and the outcome for your life, right? Like the harder you work, the better you're supposed to do. But as they degrade our money, that connection between those two things is increasingly distant. And it, it doesn't matter how hard you work more and more, you know, the, the ideal, like the the proverbial American dream of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and making Mm. it, making it good based on hard work and, and, and risk taking and intelligence is, is, is just not a real possibility for the vast majority of, of people living in the world, let alone America right now. And that weighs on people in a way that I don't think people are really realizing. And that feeds this, this culture that has also been created by the same thing. You know what? We've 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 allowed them to print all this money that they've then used to incentivize the loudest and least acceptable parts of our culture. And so that's when we see the whole the trans agenda getting just like an absolutely insane amount of attention to, as compared to the number of people that are actually trans in the world. You know, the 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 ways that they've twisted our culture using the money that they printed are weighing on people in the same way. So in, in one sense, they're not getting the outcome that they expect because the money's being stolen, but then the, the money once stolen is being spent to actively make their lives worse. And it's propped up this, this, this sort of perfect storm, I guess you could call it of it, 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 like 
cuts the feet out from under, especially young people. And so many of these things are things that, that I like. So you've got like your Uber Eats, your food delivery, you know, video games, Xbox, marijuana, alcohol, Pornhub. These things are set up to kind of dull us, you know, and everything about our easy to access disposable culture that has been funded in large part by the fiat machine it is it, it's like the in the in the book night the brave new world where they're 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 kind of talking about the the dangers of unrelenting excess that could result from capitalism we're kind of at that point where we've got this thing called the soma which is like the the drug that they give us to dull us so that we don't see yeah the problems with the world and that's why people have such problems getting out of bed in the morning because you know they you, your choices are between take the easy path order some some seed oil filled bullshit and eat it in bed while jerking off and playing Xbox, or you can get out and do the hard work. But the fact is that if you do do the hard work, it's very likely that you're not going to be rewarded for your hard work because the money that you're going to be paid in will not all go to you. The value will not all go to you. And a large part of the value of the work that you actually do in a roundabout way goes to that, goes to the government, goes to the bureaucrats, goes to the stuff that they want to spend money on in that entire machine, as well as the lube industry, right? And yeah. so if you're a, a hardworking entrepreneur and your neighbor works for Deloitte, you know, they one of you boat. has, a, yeah. yeah, exactly. They, they, they have a boat yeah. and, and you're making sacrifices to mm -hmm. be able to, to run your business. Yeah. And it's that disconnect that weighs on people, I think, in such a spiritual way. And that, I, I, the best way that I found it, like I said, is a malaise. It just, it gets into people's souls and it, it robs them of hope. And, you know, we've, we've seen the, the meme a million times that Bitcoin is hope. And it really is like, I would be, I would be terrified for the future of the world right now if Bitcoin didn't exist. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, I kind of see it as like, there's this dual attack, right? It's kind of like, it's the attack on the individual where I think people realize that they cannot be complacent right and and that that realization is not that's not nice right it's not it's 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 not a fun feeling when you realize okay apparently i was complacent and apparently i cannot right in the sense that uh, you know i i love to to be on reddit and like the millennial subreddit and stuff where you see people talk about this right like i'm doing everything that was told that i was told to do and i feel that i am behind where my parents were at the same age, for example, right? Or people thinking about, should I have children or not? And all these things. And so it's kind of like that is this attack on this, yeah, the individual spirit or something, right? Like what you think you can make out of your life, something like that. And, and, and the other part of the attack is kind of realizing that, and, and that ties into the complacency. I think this, this, this blind trust in the government that you just should not have, <laughs> apparently is also boiling to the to the surface right and i think one of my biggest insights was that yeah well if you realize that the government is just other people yeah that that that's also a pretty rough realization right so there's these these, these things that come together on on people that are not have not been challenged in their lives right i sometimes i think you know in the western world we have it way way better than than you know center of Africa or something like that. I just said a random location, but I mean, you know what, again, you know what I mean? You know, but these, these people know the struggle of life and, and we don't you know in the West, I think, because we, 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 we parasite it of, of those people on, on those people. Right. But just that, that, that confrontation in a short amount of time, I think is what makes people so I think they're easily influenced and that's why, you know, it's super left or it's super right, you know, or they just stand still and let themselves be the subject of, you know, whatever, whatever. I think that's kind of where, it, where, where it leads to. Yeah, definitely. It's, it is absolutely an attack on the spirit of the individual. As you said, it is this class of people who believe that they have the ability as well as the moral right to spend the value that you create with your time. and and spend it in a better way than you would have otherwise spent it. And the problem with that, as you mentioned, is that the, the government is just a bunch of people and, you know, they can, they can spout all the rhetoric about all of their big ideas. I think the, the, the history of the world at this point has amply demonstrated that central planning is not a good way to make decisions. It's not a good way to essentially allocate 
our time, which is what we're what we're doing when we we form an economy and we use money to price things and transact. We're essentially allocating the time for everyone in the economy. The 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 ability to do that centrally has proven time and time again to be a very bad to lead to a very bad outcome. And you know, it's very easy to get sucked into the debates about essentially needing better government. And that I think is a lot of what the political discourse of the world comes down to these days is that the we need we just need smarter people to do better things with the money that they they ultimately steal. And the problem with that is that no one is actually better than their incentives. Exactly. And yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. when the incentives don't line up to create negative consequences in the event of a failure on their part, but do create positive consequences just for doing anything, just for existing. You mm. know what I mean? Just for spending the money, they get positive consequences. And let alone the fact that they, in many cases, spend the money in a way that's personally beneficial. And so for me, I've started to try to look at the human interaction and especially politics and the economy in, in, in terms of incentives as much as possible. And this came out of during COVID, you know, we obviously had two very different viewpoints coming at the world and trying to trying to convince each other of the truth. And I, with some, like, like most people, I think I had some, some significant disagreements with some people very close to me. And I made what I, I figured was an intellectually honest attempt to discuss the matter. And I actually did a whole bunch of research and came with a whole bunch of sources. And I was like, okay, I think my perspective is important. I want to tell you about it. I, I, I want to hear your perspective and like, see if we can find some common ground here which should be the, the heart of like intellectual discourse, you'd think. But when we got into this, I very quickly found that almost every source I presented, they would say that's not a good source, right? Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't accept my sources unless they were like official government sources. And so it's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose that the government-funded state media is, in fact, not a good source. It's certainly not a good source of impartial information. So at the end of the day, we were very far apart and we were not really able to come to any kind of agreement because we were getting our information and trusting information from different sources. But when I thought about it after the fact, it it can really be viewed, and you can look at climate change just as simply in the same way, is it can really be viewed as where do the incentives lie? And so when somebody comes to you and they say, there is this very scary thing, maybe it's a volcano maybe it's El Chupacabra, whatever it is, they say, there's a very scary thing. And the only way to avoid this very scary thing that I can't prove to you exists or, sh- or show you in any way is to pay me. You know, you, you kind of have to look at it as like, where are the incentives? It's like buying volcano insurance from a, a volcano expert at your door who claims mm-hmm. there's a volcano could be showing up at any moment. And that's the part that you can trust. You can always trust the incentives. You can trust that people will follow their incentives and you, you can't necessarily always see all of everyone's incentives, but when you do see them, you can follow them. And that in and of itself is the, the, the fatal flaw in the idea of collectivism is that when you gather these resources together, they will inevitably be spent in the best interests of the people who decide how they're spent. Yeah, I, I don't have a fun thought, but it, it made me think that just the simplicity of your argument, right? Could it, you know, when you say like, could it be that the state funded media talks in a way that the government wants? Just that, if you ask someone, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that and that triggers them immensely. I, I get this idea that we are already pretty far down down the road with that, right? Yeah. If, you, if you cannot even come to, I would say the logical conclusion that probably is so that a state funded media would talk in a way that a government wants, you know, I'm not saying people are devils and all these things, just, you know, the rational conclusion. Yeah. yeah if you, if you cannot handle that, wow. You know, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. That, it, it's, the conversation uh, won't even happen. Yeah. I like your, I like your analogy of the party because it very much feels like the remaining and this is a very, it's a very large group of society still, but it's a, it's a rapidly shrinking group, I think. And it's a group that is being more and more rapidly confronted with reality is this extreme left element of Western society. And I think it's actually much worse, strangely, in North America than it is in Europe. They're like the last, like they're the last couple people still like trying to have like a dance party 
on the tables drinking champagne on the Titanic, right? Like they're no, 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 no. <laughs> they're pretending to still be at a party. Yeah, it's it's like a, a delusion, <laughs> right? So yeah, so so we had a party. A lot of people were kicked out of the party because you know the music stopped, and then the people that you were describing still have the illusion that there is yeah. a party. I think it's that. Well, and then it's funny that you came back to the to the party analogy because I was thinking. And yeah, the people in government, the people who work for the government, the people get that get paid, you know, with the free money, the freely created money, they are at a whole different party. They don't, need, they, you know, they are. They know that they are at a secret party, you know, something like yeah, that. And so, yeah, we, we're we're off. We we Bitcoiners are off on an island drinking coconut mai tais, and the 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 liberal elite are standing on the table drinking champagne on the Titanic. As exactly. it's going down, and they yeah, yeah. they're they're ignoring the fact that it is an obviously untenable and unsustainable situation that is likely to end in a catastrophic collapse at any moment. Yes. So to come back to 2010, and and you see this <laughs> evolving, right? And 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 over the years, you started to understand the problem. We see Bitcoin being monetized, right? People are figuring out what what is this thing worth. You see it go from fourteen to seventy four thousand dollars while understanding why that is so can can you take me on your thoughts around around that like what for people that have gotten into bitcoin at sixty k or fifty k whatever it's not that much of a difference right but I would say fourteen dollars to seventy four thousand dollars is so yeah what 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 is your experience there yeah I mean I think there's very few people way back then who bought and held Bitcoin because of its its power as an economic tool of change, hmm. because of its its inflation resistance. I think it was looked at as like a form of, of, of payment that was going to increase freedom. But I don't think there were very many people at all who were talking about the hard money aspect. And some some of the first people that I ever heard that from, Francis Pouliot, my, my co-founder at Bull Bitcoin, came into the space from an economics background in about 2013 and immediately saw Bitcoin in that sense. And I think that era, like sort of 2013, 2014, is when I started to hear that kind of talk first coming out about Bitcoin as a tool of, of change for freedom and a way to reform our monetary system. And then the Bitcoin standard came out, I think, I want to say that came out 2018. That was like the 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 perfect encapsulation of all the discussion that had been happening around bitcoin and hard money it was the first like large scale treatise that said like okay this is what money is this is what bitcoin is and this is why it's important and obviously yeah. i think has changed countless lives with that book we were we were lucky enough we we put on a conference here in calgary called the bitcoin rodeo and we did the first one in 2018 and we were lucky enough to get safety in right after that book came out and i think we were his first Bitcoin conference actually, and it was nice. uh, it was a fiery a fiery moment. It was a great great speech that he delivered there, and definitely made some Bitcoin maximalists that day. So I think that is sort of the path that's been going, and I, I think now you've got so many different people out there talking about hard money and coming up with different ways to phrase it and coming up with different ways to explain it to people that like there's just an unlimited amount of content out there if you want to consume it. So yeah. I think that's sort of what's driven this larger level of understanding. And now I think an area that there's a lot of growth potential in, I hope, which is why we started this new this new show. And a lot of what we've been doing with our events lately is trying to reach out with conversations to the sort of like Bitcoin adjacent communities, the people that we believe are like the next future Bitcoiners, the, the freedom community, the people who have at least identified the problem and are now potentially open to a solution, the gold community, people that are have identified money as a problem. And I think, like I said, that we're we're coming into an era where that kind of crossover content that is still about Bitcoin, but ultimately touches on things that are easier to approach for people's lives yeah. and gives them a connection to think about is, is the, the next big step. And you know, there's there's more than enough content out there discussing the macroeconomic outcomes from from bitcoin and and you know you can watch robert breedlove and michael, michael saylor talk about hard money for endless hours so i think, I think it's uh, five and a half hours <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think the next i think the next big thing is really 
moving into these these adjacent communities and, and starting the conversation there. I think to 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 m- maybe make that the question that I asked more specific, I think it's more about so the people that are getting in now, right? They get in at like 50, 60,000, 40, whatever, or 5,000 two years ago, right? The the story of Bitcoin is that, you know, this will go up forever because, you know, Bitcoin has no top because fiat has no bottom, Max Kaiser. What I actually wanted to ask, maybe this is better. What is it like seeing that thesis, the idea play out? So going from 14 to 74,000, I think that. So, <laughs> yeah. so there's all this talk. Right. But you've seen it. You know, if you get into Bitcoin at 50K, you know, you're nice with your plus uh, 50%. You know, you're, you're happy, but, but it's not, you, you don't see the trajectory yet. And I think you've seen it. I think, yeah. you know, does that make it more so, clear? It does. Yeah. Because okay. those, those prices seem crazy, right? Like it seems to, to a person who's especially new to Bitcoin and comes in there and they're looking at buying at 70K or something like that. And you, if you were to tell them it might go to a million, that seems completely insane to them. And this, this is kind of encapsulated in this series of conversations that I've had. The first one being in 2011, I, I want to say when I was, I was mining Bitcoin and I was selling it on local Bitcoins and I had, I met this guy and Bitcoin had just run another run up after the $14 one. It had run from, I want to say like $3 up to $35, something like that. And this guy sitting down with me to buy some Bitcoin was like, Oh, I can't believe I missed it. And saying that you missed it at $35 seems kind of ridiculous now, right? Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, Bitcoin had crashed to like $10, which is still like triple what it had been before, but now, you know, drastically reduced from from the peak and I was meeting with another guy and he gave me this the like the opposite story. He was like, "I can't believe it's dead." And I was like, to both of those things, I was like, "I don't know, man. I don't know if it's dead. I don't know if you missed it. Like, I didn't really know anything at that point." And you know, I spent a lot of my my career in Bitcoin, one way or the other, selling Bitcoin to people. And that conversation is one that I've had over and over and over again at different price points. And is some is I don't think I've had it yet at this price point, but it would make perfect sense, right? Somebody could say, I can't believe I missed it. I and and everybody you, you've probably experienced this too. Every Bitcoiner has their non-Bitcoiner friends who tell you, I could have gone in at this price. And like, yeah. oh, I heard about it back then and I, I almost bought some at this price or whatever. And the the fact is like you you, you didn't miss it. You know, it's like it's and the 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 absurdity of the feeling that Bitcoin could go to a million dollars right now was exactly the same way that we felt when Bitcoin was six hundred dollars, talking about whether it could go to three thousand dollars. Yeah. And and all the way up, we had these conversations the whole way, and they've all been the same. And the, the fact is that we don't know where it can go, but that the logic behind Bitcoin has no top because the dollar has no bottom, like the math is there. Like we can we can understand why it would keep going up if you understand the math behind fiat. Yeah, I don't want to go on like a, a, a walk your talk, proof of work tangent, right? Like I've could, I could have gotten in and stuff. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I just did the math. And I love that you say it's just math, right? Like the thesis has not changed. It it actually has been substantiated with, Mm -hmm. you know, real life numbers and implications and everything that's happened. But if I divide 74,000 by 14, I get 5,285. But if you divide a million by 70,000, it's only 14.2, right? So just that is you know it 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 well, makes it, it makes so much sense and i think like i don't really like talking about price or saying like oh it's going to be you know a million 10 million whatever but yeah like maybe the the question is are we still early and i think the the answer is yes yeah right and well, and, and, and 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 it's an important thing sorry <laughs> like to to challenge your mind during the, you know some people say like oh it's already there for 15 years and blah like Dude, what do you expect? What do you expect after 15 years? Do you think books were fully adopted after 15 years or something like what? You know, it's money is the biggest thing that we can improve or replace, you know? So it, it, it's bigger in my opinion than, you know, steam engine stuff, like, stuff like that. So if you then say like, okay, 15 years and it's still, you know, volatile, whatever, whatever the arguments are, it's just, it's, it's too short of, of a time frame. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I, I want to paraphrase a quote, and I can't remember. It was either Francis or Svetsky 
couple of years ago at Bitcoin Miami said that 10,000 years from now, people will look back and they'll say, what were the three most important inventions in human history? And they'll say, fire, Bitcoin, and teleportation. So I love that. That's uh, Because it it really is, it's fundamental to everything, right? It's our our ability to maintain a civilization and our modern society is predicated on our ability to specialize and cooperate with each other. You know, if every single person had to build the house that they live in and provide the food that they eat, we would not have nearly the same abundance that we're able to enjoy in the world right now. And that cooperation is possible in one of two ways. It can either be forced upon us from a central authority that holds a monopoly on violence and does not allow us to dissent from their ideas about how we should allocate our time and resources. And this is, you know, I'm, I, there, there are two things that you might think of when I describe this. And one is, you know, the the, the history of slavery, right? We the, Throughout the world, people have used violence to enslave others, to force them to use their time to create value that they didn't get any of, right? If you're forced to work all day, every day, and you get paid Mm -hmm. nothing, you're a slave. And the other thing that I'm describing with exactly the same words is just collectivism, right? And the level of collectivism is in line with the level of slavery, right? If you're forced to work 100% of your time and you get paid nothing, you're you're completely a slave. But if you're forced to work 100% of your time and you get paid 10% of what you earn, then now you're only 90% a slave. (laughs) <laughs> right so but you're you're still a slick i think that's the th- that's the the moral quandary that we're solving right is that as individuals we have the right to our time to our person and to our property and only in the application of that in a way that is organized based on well understood and direct incentives can we actually achieve the the massive prosperity that we've achieved in society and the money underpins all of that. Money allows us to find a way to allocate our time. Right? Yeah. It allows us to find a way to cooperate in, in, in a way that creates a larger order out of many small decisions. You know, it's an emergent process wherein the, the state of the world emerges from many small choices. And that's really how every single system in the world works, from a, an ecosystem to an economy. And if you try to fight that, you're going to have a bad time. And that's really the, the the question of whether or not collectivism and socialism is viable is whether or not you think that this small group of people can make these decisions better than the collective decisions of the individual. And the answer is very obviously no. It's very obviously been demonstrated that they can mm-hmm. do a better job. Yeah. Like who would want this? I'm thinking I, I love the fire Bitcoin teleportation example. It's yeah. such a, it's such a good point. Such a good point if you ask people who who wants teleportation and everyone's going to be like, yeah, who who wants to be able to live on Mars? Yeah. You know, like who wants free food? Yeah. Like all the all, any, any, anything that makes us progress. Right. And move forward and be able to do new things. Everyone would say yes. But yeah, if there's no people that can actually, you know, have the time to figure out how that is possible, then you know, we are, we are never going to get there. So it's like, if you want that, you cannot have a group of people that want, they call it like the rent seekers. You don't want, you don't want people that are leeches or have a free ride. No, these people, also you and I, we need to provide for the people who are going to figure teleportation out. I yeah. would say. Right? It, yeah, hundred percent. And if we are not incentivized to do that, then yeah, you, you will not have teleportation. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it brings to mind this interesting idea. I think I've talked about it somewhere before. Where so are you, are you familiar with the, the the concept of the Fermi paradox? Yes, I've I it, yes, but I couldn't quote it. But yeah, uh, so I've heard it before. So I'll, I'll sum it up. It, it's this this idea that based on everything that that science tells us, the evolution of life in the universe should be quite common, and so it actually doesn't make sense that we haven't we haven't found any traces of intelligent civilizations in, in the universe. Right. And there's a bunch of different potential theories about what could explain that. And one of those theories that I, I, I really like is called the great filter theory. And the great filter theory is this idea that there is something about the evolution of life, or maybe it's about the evolution of society or the way that intelligent beings organize themselves. There's something that's fundamental to the universe that is very hard to overcome. 
So it could be something really granular and simple. Like it could be that maybe, maybe the evolution of multicellular life is very unlikely and something happened to cause that, Mm. you know, maybe, maybe life evolving for as long as it has, you know, we're in kind of a unique spot on earth where we don't get hit by that many meteors because of where Jupiter is. We have a lot of very like sort of unique sweet spots that allow life to be here. But the idea generally is that maybe there's a reason why people or, or intelligent beings don't evolve to the point that we're at or beyond that to multi-planetary civilizations. And there might be like, there might be a hurdle to solve. And I think there's a very real chance that Bitcoin could be that kind of a hurdle. And because, because when it comes down to it, like I said, we're talking fundamentally about how we organize our time as a society and as a group. And if we, if we misspend the vast majority of the value that we create with our time, which is what's going on right now, the vast majority of the value is being diverted to governments and misspent by being funneled into the lube industry and the regulatory apparatus of every government in the world and enriching the, the special interests that surround those things. So I, I would argue that it, it's very easy to demonstrate that the majority of the value on Earth is being misspent. And all of that value that's being misspent is now value that cannot go towards inventing teleportation or, or towards yeah. the next big thing, whatever that is. And I believe that it's, it's very likely that a society that consistently wastes all of its time or value or a very large percentage of its time or value cannot succeed in the long term. It just doesn't make sense because we have, we, we've, we've reached the point that we're at with this drive that is innate in all of us to overcome scarcity. You know, we always want more prosperity. We want more abundance for ourselves, for our families and our future. And that's kind of an an innate thing that every human that is, has evolved to live this long has inside of us. And if that gets stolen from us, because the incentives are twisted away from that being a viable path, I don't see that being a society that can survive even, even the medium term. Like mm-hmm. it, with, without the invention of Bitcoin, I would I would posit that there was a very good chance that we'd be talking about decades or or hundreds of years left for the the human race, rather than potentially thousands or millions of years that that could in theory exist. Yeah, I agree with I I think the tendency of humans. I love what Joe Rogan says about you know the why do the bees do what they do? They they don't they don't know. Right. And then he talks about like, what would that be for humans? And his concept is, and I agree with it. And and I think you just said it, like our entire goal is to progress, right? Become, become better, more efficient, just progress. I think it's just the word. Yeah. And if that is our innate desire and we currently see that, you know, it's not, it's just not the case. Last week, uh, yeah, I was in this car museum, right? And there's electric cars from 1910. There's luxury cars from 1930 with the, the prettiest leather on it, right? Like the, the just the, the, the most prime material. And then, you know, some people would argue, yeah, but that's not for mass production. Right? Well, that's not the point. Just the entire pride that's taken into the grill of this car, right? Or just anything like that is just so scarce nowadays. And I think it's not consciously the people's fault, right? But it's 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 because, yeah, our incentives are messed up. I think the incentives are, yeah. are a good thing to talk about. And the incentives are messed up. Like, why would I chisel like <laughs> Michelangelo, you know, something from a marble rock like why why would i do that tomorrow you know <laughs> yeah 100 yeah. percent. it's and the electric car is a really interesting one because going back to the time when cars were just becoming like a real market product and a capitalist motivated by his incentive to drive profit to himself created a better product with the realization that gasoline has a lot more energy density than a battery. And so it's a lot more appropriate to run a car off of something with a lot higher energy density, meaning you have a lot less weight to pull than an electric, an electric car. And we're only now, you know, a hundred years later, getting to the point where electric cars can kind of compete with the ability of an internal combustion engine to actually drive you around. 
right? Like they're, they're demonstrably worse at that, but they are at least close. Yeah. And the only reason that they've gotten close is because of that misaligned incentive, because this massive machine that has created the carbon hoax that is driving the incentives away from the best product for the consumer. It's driving the incentive towards, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it is a, it's, it's ideologically driven by this need to, to account for and reduce carbon, which has become this dogmatic religion that has swallowed up almost all of environmentalism. You know, it used to be save the whales, clean water, clean air. Now it's just carbon alone that dictates the environmentalist regime. Yeah. And that whole, like the, the, the carbon scam doesn't come from nowhere. This is not an organic idea that has popped up. This is something that has been deliberately created and funded with the money that they steal. It's funded with government money that goes to special interest groups that then goes to procure more government money for more special interest groups. And in the, in the end funds things like incentives for green energy and, and electric cars. And now we've, we've gone back to twisting the, the incentives. And now the incentive for a consumer normally would be, I should buy the car that drives me around the best. But now because the government's injecting some of the money that they've stolen into the equation, that incentive doesn't line yeah. up nearly as well. And the electric car ends up looking appealing. Yeah, this could be a whole nother podcast recording. But what I find interesting is that nobody talks really about that, what you just said, but also there's cars that ran on water. You know, people, people made them. Those, some of those people died. That's another story. But like, you know, this, so, so it's, it, I mean, that's not even my point. It's more like, you know, there's people that talk about free energy, ether, you know, cars running on water, you know, just stuff, stuff like that. Whether it works in mass production and all these things, it do, doesn't really matter. But shouldn't the collective effort be, let's figure out the best mode of transportation, right? And the fact that the oil industry has such a lobby, you know, it's really strong and all this, like, this is all part of these misaligned incentives, because if we would collectively want to move towards a point where we have teleportation, I think a step before that would be, do we have control of energy or free energy or abundant energy like the seawater or, you know, whatever the, 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 the output of, of that is, right? But we are in this kind of like weird war between oil, gas, wind, solar. And the, and the water people aren't even, you know, part of this equation. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I get, I, I go to these places a lot where I think like, yeah, the, the, all these things are happening. But what is like if we zoom one, le zoom out one level more? It's just like it's the same game. It's like incentives are wrong. Some people think, you know, they're doing the right thing. Other people think they are doing the right thing. You know, the people who are actually for, you know, who, who protests for, you know. A better world and all these things. They, I, I never see them talk about cars running on water, for example. So I don't know. They miss that in some way, you know. So it's just it's more the the point's more like oh, yeah, people don't even know what to believe anymore, and I think that's the point, you know. Like yeah. we we are not collectively thinking about moving forward. It's just all these, yeah, all this battle. And it it's I I think there's this this issue that's kind of fundamental to the way that humans think and. That goes back to the issue that we are, you know, we're wired for tribal thinking, right? For most of our, our history, we would have lived in groups of like a hundred. In a group of that size, collectivism can make a lot more sense, right? You know, you, you want to take care of your neighbor. You want to take care of your family. Your incentives align with those people and your values tend to align with those people. And where they don't, you can just talk about them and, and, and solve the differences in values. And, so this idea that there is this greater good, you know, that's what you hear from the, the collectivists all the time. There's a greater good that can somehow be achieved. And that ideal of the greater good, meaning that everybody has as good of a life as possible, is something that I think most people can get behind. But the problem is that they believe that there's this special class of people who have the authority and ability to reallocate the resources in a way better than the individual, when in reality, the only way to achieve something like that greater good, meaning the, the greatest amount of prosperity for everyone involved, is to allow the individuals that make up that group to all make their individual decisions and then allow that 
greater good, whatever it looks like, to emerge from the context of those many, many small decisions. And that's really the only path forward for the, the, the long-term prosperity is of humans, even collectively. That's the only path forward. That's the only way that we can collectively achieve yeah. the goals that we imagine are possible for the future of humanity. Yeah. Yes, fully agree. I think just thinking about that, right? Do I want other people that are no better than me decide where we all should go? Is that, is that like, is that, you know, and other people say, well, that's democracy, but if it's, it's more the concept, do I want to give, you know, spend my time and energy, get a reward, pay taxes, and then just, you know, let it, let it fly. Is that something that I want to do? Yes or no. I think that's a decision or a thought that, that not a lot of people thought about like that. Yeah. That's where it should start. Right. Well, but, where does Bitcoin then, then come in? Like, is Bitcoin then, I thought about it like this before, like, is Bitcoin then on the, you know, the, the reward creates the incentive. And because the reward is hard, it's, it, it's scarce, right? It's, it's, uh, it's hard to make and it's finite. It works in a way that it, it does remove the bad incentives, right? Because if people are competing for a verifiably finite scarce reward they have to deliver value before they actually well real world value before they get that reward right so is that the mechanism that bitcoin then then fuels it 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 will align the incentives and remove the bad incentives yeah ultimately so there's this famous quote that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others <laughs> in churchill yeah and and that's very true right but the 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 problem with that, and and you can you can also illustrate with a, a quote that I don't know where this is from, but I, I heard Francis say this on another podcast recently that democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner, and you inevitably will always in any group have the majority of people, the the poorest sixty percent, will always control fewer resources than the richest forty percent, right? And, and probably a much greater skew than that in most groups. And if you ask the poorer majority whether they should have some of the resources of the richer minority, they will invariably say yes, right? They will invariably vote to redistribute those resources in their own favor. And I think, you know, the, 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 the quote from, from Churchill that it's the, be the worst form of government except for all the rest takes for granted the idea that we need a form of government because it was coming from a time and even even to this day, it's still a little bit applicable, but I think this is something that's changing. It was coming from a time where the, the non-consensual concentration of resources, meaning like taxes from a nation state and or money printing, was kind of necessary for the survival of, of a given people, a given tribe, because you had a very, you had a very literal and, and linear scaling on the rewards of spending money on violence. So if you had money to spend on a whole bunch of knights in the Middle Ages, you had a safer country. And at the core, providing that, that essentially physical safety and the protection of property rights was the, the basis for the creation of the state. The idea that this entity should pool resources to maximize the concentration of violence to be able to, to defend our capital and our resources is where the idea comes from. And then from there, you know, they added on like every other thing that they, that somebody thought should be done. Right. There's a, there's a great quote, a book I highly recommend called the moon is a harsh mistress. Mm. And the quote is something to the effect of that, which I fear most are the sober, well-intentioned actions of reasonable men to give to government the power to do something that really seems like it needs to be done. And <laughs> it, like there are so many good reasons to give this group of people who ultimately should have been there as a service provider to provide the, the protection of physical safety and property rights and nothing more. There, there arise all kinds of good reasons to give them more power to do more stuff. Yeah. And, and, and they'll never give that power up. And that's why we're at the point that we're at in yeah. the economy now. And like back to your original question, Bitcoin removes their ability to tax us with money printing, essentially. It removes the ability to tax us in a non-direct way. So in a Bitcoin standard, the government can still show up at your door with guns and demand ransom or taxes or whatever you want to call it. But 
they have to do it in a very direct way. They can't do it out the back door and pretend that it's not them. They can't pretend that when grocery prices start going up, that it's not because they stole the value. They can't go blame the grocery store in the way that they're trying to do right now. Yeah. And so ultimately, it, it at least it puts the incentives on the table so that when the man with a gun comes to take your stuff, he has to look you in the eye. Yeah. Yeah. It, yes. I love that. I, it's, uh, I, I think a lot about, have you watched Peaky Blinders, you know, in like in the 1990s, 1920s, you know, these gangsters, they had like an unwritten rule, right? Like it, 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 it's kind of like the rule of basically like a gentleman's agreement, but everything was ultra transparent, right? So if we would do a deal and we shook hands, it was very clear that if you tried to screw me, that I was allowed to kill you and the other way around. And you see that in the show, right? Like sometimes they try to screw each other over and they get caught and then they're like, okay, you got me. Do you have any last wishes? No. And you know, they, they execute him. You know, it's, it's brutal. The, the, the example I think is brutal, but the mechanism is the same. It's like, you know, th that is a fair agreement. It's an equal agreement up front. And we both know there's still a chance that the other person might try, but we have a backup. That they also agree to, basically, right? So there's there's like there's like two underlying agreements on under the main agreement. But I think we could get back to that because it's also well not that that we shoot each other, but more like the I I, I think the introduction of Bitcoin in value exchanges, right, or these agreements between people, it kind of how do you say like it diffuses our own corruptibility, like our individual corruptibility, right? Like my survival, my personal survival is more important than your personal survival, right? I, If there was a choice, you know, I choose that you die and not me and the other way around, right? So in that way, you know, if the context would give me an option, I would corrupt my options and, and make sure you die and that, that I live, right? Like, I think we all have that, that just that innate corruptibility because we want to survive. And I think Bitcoin, as a neutral tool brings that back into our value exchanges in a way, maybe the Peaky Blinders <laughs> did the same yeah. with their unspoken agreements. But now it is, it is, if I offer Bitcoin, I also offer you that possibility to remove the corruptibility from our value exchange. And, and the same for if you ask it from me. And I think the magic of Bitcoin on top of that is that it's global 24 7 365 and we could actually have a collective opportunity to have value exchanges that well stick with teleportation bring us to to the teleportation yeah. point yeah yeah and I, I think it's it's really important to get all those incentives back on the table there's a there's a fantastic essay by Ayn Rand that i would recommend everybody read called the virtue of selfishness mm -hmm. and it, it goes very much to the core of some of her other writing but it's something that I think has been really twisted in the world and it's what you're describing there. And it, it's, it's, it's a rational part of life that for most of human history, everyone's been a lot more okay with than they are right now is this idea of selfishness and the idea of, of putting the interests of yourself and your family and your own, your tribe, your core people around you ahead of the, of others. Hmm. And that is also a path to a very, reasonable and an equitable form of business relationship. If you and I want to enter into a business relationship and we both expect the other one to act in our best interests, like I'm, I'm not expecting any charity from you. You're not expecting charity from me. We're both expecting rational selfishness mm -hmm. with the goal of forwarding our own best interests. Now we have a tremendous context to form a business relationship that forwards both of our best interests, right? But, and, and that's the whole point of a deal, right? Like I think yeah. I did well and you think you did well. That's yeah. what you it, would it, love to achieve, it, right? Yeah, exactly. And nowadays, because so much of the value that we're talking about has been siphoned and spent in other ways, they've twisted the idea that you should be operating in your own best interests into this form of, like, like they, they've demonized the, the self. They've demonized the pursuit of your self-interest to the point where, just the context that you know it's it's obviously absurd that they're they're blaming grocery stores for the rise of, of food prices when that's demonstrably not the case we can look at grocery stores margins and see that they're they're making less on as a percentage basis on on what they're selling than they were even five years ago but even if they were even if they were price gouging even if they were taking gratuitous steps to enrich themselves it's this idea that that's not okay right if 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 you don't like what the grocery stores are doing and you think that 
the grocery stores are charging too high of margins and making too much money because they're overly selfish, start another grocery store. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> like, and that's not possible, right? That, yeah. that is the point. Yes. Yes. Very, very, very good point. Because yes, 100%, dude, that shows you don't, you don't live in a capitalistic society. <laughs> you know, the fact that yeah. that's not possible. Yes, exactly. And also, you know, maybe if there's another store that has lower prices, because that would be the incentive, right? If your competitor ups the prices, maybe, you know, you can not change them or lower them or become more operational, you know, operationally efficient to lower the prices so you can get more people like that. Yeah, a hundred percent. But this, yeah. this, this is a great and example of how the incentives are already so messed up and, and people don't even realize. And by the way, it's almost simplistically funny how pointing at the bad business people that you know make the food is just as bad as pointing to the bad immigrants right it's the same tactic you know yeah, it's, it's, without it's talking exactly about the, the actual origin of, of of the problem i do wonder and i wonder what you think like do you think i love this conversation that we go so deep on this but like do you think that a lot of people understand this even in the government they are pointing do you think they <laughs> really think that or do you think they understand the problem and then just find a scapegoat or are, well, are they just gaslighting there, by by chance there, there are certainly some evil people in the governments around the world who are deliberately working to undermine the interests of the individual and support the globalist corporatist concentration of resources going on in the world like there are super villains out there that are literally like in actual ivory towers laughing with their fingers and the cat in their lap but I don't think that's the norm. I think that the majority of the people who are in the government have, are, are victims of the same force. They're victims of mm -hmm. the same twisting of incentives, and they believe that they're part of a machine that's making the world a better place. And it, it's also this this idea that you know it's it's very hard to convince someone of an idea if their paycheck depends on them not understanding that idea. And so it's very like realistically you go walk into a government building anywhere in the world you're going to find some mild-mannered perfectly nice civil servants who probably not the, the the top performers in anything they've ever done in life you know they're they're the ones that are happy to coast to a certain extent but very nice people who believe that they're doing good things and and think that they're a part of a, the, the cogs in a very valuable machine right they don't see it as they're the moochers and the leechers which is really the case they're the they're the parasite class that is living off of the useful people in the world. They're living off of how many useful people are left, right? Because the incentive is not to continue to be useful. The incentive is actually to join the parasite class these days, the way the world is going. And I think circling back, ultimately, Bitcoin puts those incentives all back on the table. And it, it will bring us back to a point, I believe, wherein the rational pursuit of self-interest and, and, and selfishness in the rational pursuit of self-interest, especially in a business context, and especially at, at the global or national scale, you know, you're not talking about like, may, maybe you're maybe you're kinder in business dealings if you're dealing with your grandma, but most of the time you're not dealing with your grandma. You're dealing with, you know, somebody that you know that that is also pursuing their best interest. And I believe that because Bitcoin removes the ability to siphon that value away and therefore twist those incentives, it will lead to a world where our incentives are much more upfront again. They're much more on the table. And when we're dealing with one another, we're dealing in a much more honest way because we can see each other's incentives. And we know that, you know, if I'm to strike a business deal with you, there's a very good chance right now that your incentive to strike that business deal with me may not have anything to do with running your business. It may have to do with getting a government grant. It may have to do with positioning yourself in, in in order to get a new government contract or something like that. And all of those sort of shadow incentives that twist everything about the economy will no longer be something that they can they can execute without putting their own incentives and their own intentions on the table. And so in much the same way as like I mentioned, when the when the man with the gun comes to take your stuff, he has to look you in the eyes. When the government has to openly tax people in order to spend money it will make it a lot harder to stomach, I believe, for people to say, yes, I'm going to give up 90% of my income and I'm happy to do so because we need the sidewalks to be painted with rainbows. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a video I'm looking, I'm trying to see if I can find it on X. It was like Biden visited 
some area and he talked to local entrepreneurs, like people who had stores and stuff like that. And he asked like, Hey, how's your, how's your business going? And the woman replied, Oh, it's going really well. I got a lot of grants this year. You know, that's, that's that what you said. And that, that's, I think what I would love to emphasize also for people listening, right? Like I feel sometimes when in Bitcoin, when we talk about these things, it sounds, it sounds sometimes hard to imagine or accept that that is really what is going on because it's not a nice realization if it's actually going on. But if you, yeah, this sounds so stupid, but if you're paying attention, you see that there's real life examples of that, what we are exactly talking about, right? And just, I just, when I saw that video, I was like, this is not the answer you're looking for, right? It's yeah. not the answer you're looking for. Like if someone has a hair salon and you ask like, how's your business? The answer should be like, you know, it's, it's great. I got a lot of regular regulars, right? Like people are taking care of themselves and they, they look nice and they want to look nice. Like that, that's the answer that you're looking yeah. for, right? And not say, yeah, I got a lot of grass. Yeah. We're, we're in a world where, and, and there's all these sort of like dystopian economic warnings from the past, from mm. like Atlas Shrugged to like 1984 or Brave New World. There's a bunch of these books that, that you can see a whole bunch of parallels in in our current society, you know, it's very easy to spot. Like I, I read, I reread Atlas Shrugged in like early 2020 when COVID was first hitting. And I was like, holy shit, this is exactly what's going on in the world right now. And if you were to take the exact state of the world and just write about it, it, it would sound just as dystopian as any one of those, those novels. And there are specifics in all of those that don't line up with the way the world is now, because those are just guesses. But there are a lot of things that do line up very directly with how they predicted things might happen. And if you put them all into a book about exactly how the world is right now, the, the, we're, we're there. We're in a dystopian society right now. We're in a society where truth does not matter, where the yeah. link between a person's outcome, efforts and their outcome does not matter. And the, the easy way to sum this up that I think a lot of people can feel that also sums up sort of like the great malaise that I described earlier is like, this shit's just not right. And we can all tell. And But we were Bitcoin promised flying cars. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We I think we went pretty deep. I, I like it. I've, I, I have two last questions for you. Sure. What What is your outlook on the future of Bitcoin? Like, do you think it's inevitable? Let's take the next the next 10 years like what what's your outlook yeah so i do think it's past the point of inevitability i don't think barring like a black swan event that in some way cripples the infrastructure i don't think it's very likely to to have a failure point at this point i see the next 10 to 20 years especially globally playing out with a series of currency wars and i think we're starting to see that a little bit already you know you've seen countries like venezuela Lebanon, Zimbabwe, et cetera, have their currencies really collapse. And in most of those cases, the black market US dollar has sort of taken over. The fact is that's kind of how money works, right? It's money emerges and, and people will end up choosing what they think is the best money for them as a whole. And, and just like when you have you know a path through a field where everyone instinctively knows where the path is supposed to be and they all walk in that same spot and then the path emerges, that, that's how money emerges. And in most of those cases, it has emerged to be the US dollar. And I think we're going to see a drastic increase in the number of failed currencies that happen around the world because this tool that every government in the world has been using to essentially print money to spend money is nearing the end of its usefulness. And a lot of these countries are like, you know, either either they've already fallen off the cliff, like the ones I mentioned, or there's other ones like Argentina where they're very much, and, and I would say Canada, very much in that like Wiley Coyote moment hovering over the cliff and about to fall. And I think 10, 15 years from now, we'll probably see a world where there are like six or seven currencies left in the world. And most of the countries of the world have switched to the US dollar or regional currencies, of one kind or another. And I, I, I think Bitcoin will be one of those. Bitcoin will be competing with these currencies. And inevitably that process of emergent order will bring the best money to the top. And so when someone in Argentina right now is using the U.S. dollar, the, the first thing that they need to know about the U.S. dollar 
before that they can use it is that it's going to be a reasonable store of value for the medium term. At least. That's what they're looking at as something that is much better than their, their local currency, where it's going to lose a meaningful amount of value by literally the next day. You know, you can't store your money in yeah. that at all. So they can make a huge improvement by you moving to the U S dollar, but every government in the world, including the U S probably more than any is stuck in the cycle of the need to print money to spend money and let alone the need to print money to pay the interest on the money that you've already printed. And one by one, I see even those six or seven currencies in the world, you know, they're, 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 they're in a race to print to the bottom and eventually they too will die off one by one. And I suspect very likely that the last two standing are going to be the U S dollar and, and Bitcoin. And I don't think, when we get to that point, I don't think the U.S. dollar will last very long because it's the, you know, the the, the common saying like gradually and then suddenly, mm-hmm. because they're addicted to the money printing. They can't stop and they never will. Yeah. The only thing that could turn this path around, I see, is global governments switching to a hard money standard of some kind, which could of course never be as hard as Bitcoin. There, there are the the most obvious one would be switching back to a gold standard where your your notes are directly redeemable for a an amount of gold. Yeah. And that's that's certainly possible. That would that would be a much more meaningful form of competition with Bitcoin. But in the long term, you know, it always goes back to the same thing. If people can print money, they will. And whoever is in charge of being the custodian of that gold and the issuer of those IOUs will inevitably at some point decide to issue more IOUs and they have gold. Yeah. And now we're back to the same situation yeah, yeah, where yeah. it's not possible with Bitcoin. Yeah. So well yeah, spoken. I think I, Bitcoin I, will win. Yeah, I think this is a great pitch for Bitcoin. I think two things. I think a lot of people might think, why do you talk so much about the United States dollar, etc.? Well, it's it's uh, it's the best of the worst, right? Like yeah. all other currencies have exactly the same system. This is the strongest one, and it's doing very badly, right? And and <laughs> as you said, they they will keep printing, not because they want to, but because they have to, right? And I think once you realize that that is the path that no one really can predict how long that will take, but it is, it is the path. And that even adopting a hard money standard with gold would also have a shock, right? So then you have this kind of game theory, like, do I want to create a shock or do I want to kick the can down the road? Well, then I'll probably kick the can down the road. Yeah. Yeah, And and Bitcoin just acts as a mirror for all that degeneracy, basically. It's just, yeah. I don't know who said that, but I love that. Like, it's the only economic constant in the universe, you know? Yeah. It's just and the you, same you, thing. It's just the same thing. It's a very simple thing. And it will act as a mirror for all that stuff. Yeah. And, and eventually people will have to move, but hopefully they will make the choice before. Yeah. And you, you have to look at incentives again, because ultimately, like, the incentive for every country who can print money to spend money is to do exactly that. Mm. But at a certain point, and you see this, like Argentina is a good example where they've largely lost the ability to print money at scale to spend it. And so it used to be this game wherein the monetary policy could make up for the fiscal policy and they've lost that tool. And so since you don't have that tool anymore, you can do one of two things. You can decide we need to switch to a standard that works better as a store of value for us. But in in switching to the U.S. dollar, you're just delegating that power to the U.S. government. Another country. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas since you don't have the option to, to, to keep that power anymore, the power to print and spend, you'd be better off to just pick something that no one can print and spend. Exactly. And I think at some point in that so logical, in the, in this transition, so yeah. someone is just going to, some country somewhere pretty soon will pick Bitcoin as a real currency, not as a legal tender that is, is like a government mandated payment tool, but as the actual unit of account and underlying base unit of their economy. And whichever country does that will probably be the richest country in the world permanently. Yeah. Whoever does it first. I, it's so mind blowing. I just said it's so logical. It's so logical. I don't understand. I don't understand how, 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 you know, two plebs figured that out. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm more of us, right? But fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah it's fascinating. Love, love that, man. All right. Last question, and I ask everyone the same question, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, that's a, there's, a, there's a few of those. Back to, the, back to the theme that we've been talking about is my belief in the, the individual. That's what everything goes back to is the, 
the rights of the individual. The individual is the smallest minority, and the rights of the individual need to be protected against anything else. The right to the freedom of your person, the freedom of your property, and the freedom of your time is fundamental to any other rights that can then be built on top of that. And not only any other rights that can be built on top of that, but really every single thing has to be built on top of that, or we're in collectivism. Mm. If you don't have those things, that if you don't have those rights, it's because someone has those rights over you. They have the right to your time, they have the right to your property, and they have the right to your person. And it is either a matter of freedom or slavery, and there's not really a middle ground. So that's what I would say is the individual. Perfect ending, I would say. Yeah, David, thanks so much for, for this talk. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Sounds good. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.